Okay, let's open in prayer, eh? Father God, we love you. What a beautiful time, what a beautiful way to spend Shabbat with you, Lord, here and um, in in peace and um, and together as community. Father, we bless your holy name. We thank you for turning up on Shabbat. I pray, Father, everybody who's here feels a tangible presence of you. And we go home filled, filled, filled with the Holy Spirit today. Father, bless us, watch over us, smile your face on us. Father, you are more than welcome here. We pray in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Um, Wednesday was the first of the Hebrew month of Elul. There are 30 days in the Hebrew month. So it's 30 days and then the first of Tishrei, will be what's known as Rosh Hashanah. It's a spiritual new year, which then leads up to the 10 days, it's the 10 days of awe that lead up to Yom Kippur, when the Lord gave forgiveness and washed away the sins, right? So this is a time of introspection. 40 days is completion. 40 days. Introspection and um, soul searching trying to get close to the Lord and maybe forgiving people, maybe getting right with him. That's, that's what it's about. Are we right with him? Of course we're right with him. Judicially, we're right with him, right? Well, we need parental forgiveness, don't we? Yeah. We could all be closer to the Lord now. Well, that's what this time is about. And then Yom Kippur comes along, and it's, it's, it, it, it'd be a somber day. But it, it does say, deny yourself. So we fast, right? But we break that fast in celebration because Yeshua is our Yom Kippur. He is our covering. He is our forgiveness for sin, isn't he? That's why we celebrate. It's different. It's different. So it's going to be a beautiful day. And it's a Shabbat. So, well, the other, the other days, all, the other three, Sukkot and, um, and Trumpets will all be Thursdays. So that's why we're telling you up front, you've got a month. Book it off and, and come and join us and have, have um, some time with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, now, last week I went over seeing Yeshua in the Scriptures, right? And how through Scripture you, you, you can see Yeshua the Messiah as the prophet, the prophet, the one who speaks as God, not for God. You see him as a priest and you see him as the king. Those, those scriptures come from this section that we're in today as part of the, the Torah portion. Shoftim. Um, this Pasha that begins with the commandment that the people of Israel should appoint judges and officers so that justice would be enforced throughout the upcoming promised land. Justice. Only justice you must pursue. Zedek, Zedek, Gradaf. Zedek, righteousness. The adherence to morality, truth, and justice. Why? To achieve peace and security in a just manner. Deuteronomy 16, you are to appoint judges and officers. Officers, put your teeth in. For all your gates in the cities, Adonai your God is giving you tribe by tribe. They are to judge the people with righteous justice. Right. I've not slept a lot this week, sorry. Righteous judgment, there you go. And you are not to distort justice or show favoritism. You are not to accept a bribe. For a gift blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the, even the upright. Justice. Only justice you must pursue. So that you will live and inherit the land that I know your God is giving you. Not to distort or show favoritism. Like the world. Don't be like the world. Don't accept a bribe. Th this happens these days. In real time, Pe people are so, so easily bought and paid for now. 
They, they call it lobbying, I think. Don't accept a bribe, for a gift blinds the eyes of the wise. Not just the foolish, the wise too. Even the upright's words would be twisted, of own, twisted. Even the upright and the wise can be fooled. We have heard that one before. Even the elect can be deceived, can't we? Yeah. Sidetracked. Yes, yes we can. You, you might not realize, but you can be deceived. And if you don't think you can, you probably already are. Justice. Only justice you must pursue. So obviously context is, is Adonai wants judges, wise, upright men who render a verdict. Cases must be decided only if there are two or three witnesses. We've heard that one before. There's a New Testament scripture, isn't there? That says where two or three are gathered and everybody says, well, we'll use that in prayer. Well, it doesn't really hold because you, you can pray on your own and the Lord's right there with you, isn't there? But that's not what it's about. It's not about prayer. You, you can pray on your own. It's more about Yeshua commissioning the brethren to authoritative decisions about messianic lifestyle. That's what it's about. Yeshua was put on trial. It was a kangaroo court. They employed false witnesses. They weren't working within the framework of the Torah that they professed. So it was quite deplorable. Judges, though, are called to be impartial. Ellie knows because she's a lawyer. Passed this week. Very good. <laughs> Honest and righteous. Should be. I think we've got a corrupted, broken system. Worldwide. Worldwide. In my opinion. Legal system. Things like constitutions. Are only as good as the paper. If, if, you, if you adhere to them. If you don't, they're not worth the paper they're written on, are they? You've got to adhere to them. Not to accept a bribe. Because that renders then the bribe E incapable of a fair decision. Why a gift blinds the eyes of the wise and twists you and your decisions. Justice. Only justice. Zedek, righteousness. In the Hebrew, it, doing things the right way. Rightness, fairness, justice. It's right. But what is wrong, what's right and wrong, I suppose, is subjective, isn't it? What's right and what's wrong? Because the, the world says, well, it's all relative. There's no absolute truth, which is absolutely wrong. The world says it's relative. There's no absolute truth. So who decides right and wrong? Who decides right and wrong? It's not all relative. God gave us a standard, and therefore he's the authority to us as believers. We can be subjective. We can't be subjective, I'm sorry, with right and wrong. We have to look to God's word. Have to. On justice. His word is truth. But well, my opinion doesn't matter. Or anybody's. So that's why we're operating being immersed in the word. You've got to be immersed in the word. It's the only thing that matters if the house burns down and he's taking this if I can grab a guitar with it fair dues but this is coming with me yeah. it's the only thing that matters God's word God's justice you are not to distort 
justice. Distort, not tie, to bend or to stretch. Somebody says, oh, well, we, we just stretch the truth a little bit. That's to distort it then, isn't it? Oh, we just bent the truth a little bit. Now it's distorted. It's not the truth. Can't be the truth and nothing but the truth then, can it? It's been messed with and distorted, bent and twisted. Acts 10 says this. This is Shimon Kiefer. Kiefer the rock. He addressed them. I now understand that God does not play favorites, but that whoever fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. No matter what people he belongs to. What's this? Kiefer's vision. The vision. Which in it of itself has been terribly distorted and butchered over the years. I, I had a I had a lad from Oldham, he, he lived in Yanchep and he came to our house, he's PhD in theology. And it, his face was that red. He had a white T-shirt on. He looked like a swan vest of match. He was that angry. He was exploding because I'm like, it's nothing to do with food. Well, they teach him it is in seminary. It's everything to do with it's nothing to do with food. Nothing. Very, very animated. He was very miffed that it wasn't about allowing us all to go and eat BLTs on a Sunday morning. He wanted to punch me out, actually, but it's not the first. <laughs> but is it, it, it tells you in the narrative it's about Gentiles coming to faith. And anybody who teaches you anything other than that really has no place teaching. We really don't. But like I say, it's not unique. They, they, they do teach this nonsense in seminary. Now, let me put it in perspective for you. If Yeshua told his boys early in his ministry, um, he's made all food clean. Now, context. He's early in his ministry now. Say it's maybe 30, 30 AD. Dies in 33, right? Just for argument's sake. So now he's got three years of ministry. Kiefer has his vision, 42 AD. So 12 years. Yeshua shouts, I'm making all foods clean. Now, bear in mind, there's no Gentiles here at this point, because the first one in is Cornelius, 12 years down the line. True? He's early in his ministry. Nobody knows he's Messiah. He's in the middle of Israel, surrounded by Jews, and he shouts, hey, let's not worry about Leviticus 11 anymore. What do you suppose is going to happen? They're going to stone him on the spot. Did they? Did they? No. They never even used it against him at his trial, that kangaroo court. They had to bring false witnesses in. Maybe he didn't make all foods clean then. Maybe... We're misunderstanding the scriptures and distorting them. Like Paul said we would. Peter said we would in, in his second letter about Paul's writings and, and such. We distort the scriptures, don't we? Nobody accused him of blasphemy. They could have used it, but they didn't. So now we get to Acts. And Peter sees the vision. What's the first thing he says? Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. Why not? Because 12 years before, Yeshua said he could. Just calling it out, just saying as it is. Just saying as it is. I've never eaten anything unclean. He eats biblically cash root. Biblically. I'm not interested in rabbinics. I'm not interested in... You can't have meat and dairy. It's nonsense. That's that's a it's a, a man-made tradition, which was what Yeshua was barreling against in the first place. 
It's a man-made tradition. You can't have meat and dairy in the same room. Really? When, when Abraham met the Lord, the first thing he said to Sarah was, Hey, Sarah, go and bring the calf. Didn't he? What did he say then? Go and bring the curds. What, like cheeseburger? It's right there. Genesis 18. It's good enough for the Lord then. Just saying. Just throwing it out there for you. He's eating biblically cash fruit. He's perplexed. He's perplexed at the vision. Doesn't understand it. He's, he's, one of, he's one of Yeshua's best. He's lived with him for three and a half years. And he's been walking out of faith all that time. And he's perplexed, but we get it. We get it, don't we? And, what, and what's the best understanding we can come out with? With all our PhDs and all the rest of it. Yabba dabba do! I can eat baby bite ribs! Woohoo! That's what you get from Acts 10. Wow. No way. Perplexed. He had, he, he had no clue the Gentiles were going to come in. No clue. Yeshua told him, don't, don't worry about them. You go to the lost sheep of Israel. The lost sheep of Israel that hadn't disappeared 800 years before like some of these nutbags in Perth think. And they're all in Scotland or whatever they are. Well, honestly, Israel, he came for his people. And here we are in Acts, Acts 10, and he's got this Gentile, Cornelius, coming to faith. And it's nothing to do with food. Like Mark 7, it's nothing to do with food. It's all about the ceremonial washing of hands. Symbolism here, that he's realizing the Gentiles are coming to faith. Kepha entered the house. Cornelius met him, fell prostrate at his feet, but Kepha pulled him to his feet and said, Stand up. I'm just a man like you. And as he talked with him, Kepha went inside and found many people gathered. And he said to him, You're all well aware that for a man who's a Jew to have close association with someone who belongs to another people, Gentiles, pagans, or to come and visit is something that just isn't done. And it wasn't. But God showed me not to call any who? It food? No. It says person. Common or unclean. Boom. I understand that God does not play favourites. But that whoever fears him and does what's right is acceptable to him. No matter what people he belongs to. He's given us the meaning of the vision. This is massive. It's a game changer. And it's nothing to do with animals or food. Something that's totally unbelievable is happening. And it's going to change the course of history. And it did. Pagan Gentiles who up to this point are without hope and without God. Brought into the commonwealth of Israel. The commonwealth of Israel allowing you the same covenants, the same promises, making you all one. There's no Jew and Gentile no more. There's no, there's no elitism. There's no second class citizen. There's no, well, Jews say we've got to do it. Gentiles don't. So all the Jews over here, all the Gentiles over there, that's not how it rolls. I don't care who tells you how many PhDs they've got. I don't care. They're wrong. We're one. You're one. And you've got to come up with something better than bacon sandwich, anybody. He doesn't play favourites. But whoever fears him, fears him, see? Does what's right. Now, I do... Now, do not, I repeat, do not get bamboozled by the enemy, neither. And read this and think Peter's saying you, you can be saved by fear and works. You cannot. Hold on there, quick draw McGraw. He's not saying 
that at all. It's, it's nothing to do with salvation. Context is key. Don't let the enemy twist you. Don't let the enemy distort you. It's what he does best. You can try and do all the works all day long. Every day of your life, it's not going to save you. It's not what it's about. Only Yeshua. We're all spiritual cripples. We're all that man at the pool of Siloam. We're all that leper who came to him and said, Lord, make me clean. I know you can make me clean. We're that leper too. We're Mephibosheth. We're that crippled kid who gets to sit at the king's table too. You understand? We're all the criminals beside you sure on the cross. As righteous and law abiding as you think you, you are, you're a criminal. The only righteousness we have belongs to him. It's his garment that we wear. And we have to wear it well. We're either one of them criminals hurling insults at him or begging him to remember him. Every one of us. But he's not talking about salvation. Whoever fears him does what's right, is acceptable to him. No matter what people he belongs to, context. He's saying, up till now, up till this vision, God's favor had only rested on the nation of Israel. And that was true. But now he realizes God's not set the boundaries to any set person or nationality. doesn't matter where you're from. That's what really he's saying in, 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 in Acts when all the boys come out and speak in different languages. Because there was people there from all over the world who'd come in, Jewish people, who'd come in to celebrate Shavuot, and he said, I don't, I don't care where you're from, I can get to you. I can speak to you. I can speak right into you. All you need is an honest, contrite heart. Jew, Gentile, black, white, rich, poor man, woe man, educated or not. He's a lover of souls. And if he is, we should be too. Don't we? Need to reflect his light. Be like him. So this is consistent with the Torah portion that we're in. To appoint judges in all your gates. Deuteronomy. Appoint judges for all your gates. See? The sages interpreted gates as your senses. Seeing it on a spiritual level. Your eyes, your ears, your heart. It's deeper than the physical. When the Lord says, write these words of the Torah upon the doors of your house and upon your gates. Our natural inclinations to go astray, isn't it? But we're to guard the purity of our hearts by being focused and determined and single-minded in our attention and love for the Lord. That's our responsibility. You get a new heart that does new stuff. It gives you a new heart. What's our responsibility in that? Keep it soft. How do you keep it soft? Stay close. There's no other way. That's your responsibility. You are to appoint singular, meaning it's our duty to guard our hearts and yield as a vessel of the kingdom. Don't let your heart be divided. He wants all your heart. All. Your heart's unguided and unguarded. There's going to be trouble. It's going to be lonely. It's going to be unstable. But guarded, you're going to be faithful and believe all things, all things, hope in all things, endure all things. 
like Corinthians says, we're supposed to be like Yeshua. Reflecting him as much as we can. Now back to justice. Look at Zechariah. Don't oppress widows, orphans, foreigners or poor people. Don't plot evil against each other. So God's commanding against the mistreatment of others. So we don't. We, we don't mistreat others. Widows, the fatherless. We've got single mums here. And, we, and we've got absolutely got a heart for that. Because it's an incredibly difficult, it's a difficult country to bring kids up in on your own. Isn't it? But we're going we're gonna to be, uh, I was with Tasari yesterday, my friend Tasari, and um, she wants us to be a, a church of refuge, a house of refuge for for girls struggling with abortion and um thinking about abortion and really single mums and stuff you know and, and we do have a heart for that and we're going to need volunteers because that is something i really want to press into thanks sal well, well i'll i'll cover that in depth a little bit more but we're just just be thinking and praying into it because they're going to need support and need the it's about the, the, these these places in Perth where you get support on a physical level. There's not so much on a spiritual, and we we want to be that place. So I'm all in. Um, it's beautiful to Sari. It's got beautiful art. Um, foreigners, newcomers, who lack inherent rights. Except in Western countries now, we we can come in on a boat and get a credit card and five-star hotel accommodation and um, a driving license and get a right to vote. Actually, isn't that just peachy? There's nothing wrong with immigration. There's everything wrong with illegal immigration. The poor. Not financially, the afflicted, the needy, the weak. They, they, these these kids coming in, they're, they're not weak. They've all got mobile phones, they've all got Nike trainers, you know, and posh gear on. Fighting age men, most of them, just saying. The afflicted, the needy, the weak. Back, back in the day, kings... We're expected to take care of the needy, of society and the oppressed. David particularly remembered for that because he, he, he was the quintessential shepherd king in the physical. The kings of today, certainly anything but, they're, they're very elitist, they're very out of touch, I think. Now the ideal king protects the oppressed and the needy. You, do, do we have such a king? Yeah, we do. There's only one. He's our king. We have a prophet, a priest, and a king in Yeshua. However, he isn't here yet, is he? Soon will be, but he's left us here to occupy till he comes. Be his hands and feet. That That's the message. Well, we pray we can help the poor and the needy. That's why we're here. And he's endowed us with the power to do it. And we've all, we've all got gifts thereof. That's got to be your focus then. Part of being in the kingdom, isn't it? Use your gifts for the good, the common good. The two things that manifest in your life as a believer are your works Faith without works is dead. It's dead. And it's the labor of love. Just as 
a believer. So supernaturally, one's filled, indwelled with the Holy Spirit. It, that's what we do. We, we work for him, don't we? We work for him. The supernatural should become natural, and the natural should become unnatural. One's born again. One's filled. And it comes through connection. It doesn't come through perfection. It comes through connection. Spending time with him. And he rewards our good works. Now that might not be in this age. It will be when he comes back. His rewards are with him. When he comes back for what we have done. Not what we thought. Not what we were going to do. Not what we believe. What we've done. So when it says here, where did that come from? Hebrews, there you go. God is not so unfair as to forget your work and the love you showed for him in the past. Service to his people. That's what we've got to be all about. And in the present too. Revelation 22. Pay attention, says Yeshua, I'm coming soon. And my what? Rewards are with me to give to each person according to what he's done. So we don't always get the reward in, in this lifetime, but he will reward you. His recompense will be with him. So we've got to be all about helping the poor, the widow, the orphan, the single mum. That's true religion. We help when it's genuine. And we move when the Spirit of God tells us, and he anoints it. I can assure you, he anoints it. Whatever work you do, put yourself into it as those who are serving, not merely other people, but the Lord. That's what it's about. We're doing it for him. Remember that as you reward, you will receive the inheritance from the Lord. You're slaving for the Lord, for the Messiah. Don't worry. Whoever's doing wrong will be paid in kind for his wrong. There's no favoritism shown. No favoritism in God's economy. Everybody has to give an account. So don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Concentrate on what you're doing. Why is he more blessed than me? Well, what's it to you? Oh, he's driving around in a BMW. He, he's probably worked hard for that. He's got the payments on it as well. No, you don't have to do that, do you? You go and find a couple of grand every month for it. You know what I mean? Bless him. Good. Got a nice car. So what? Stop worrying. Concentrate on you. Remember Peter? Oh, what, what about John? And you was like, what about him? What's it to you? You, you concentrate on you, Pete. Yeah. Right? Yes. Do it, do it, follow me. All that in the midst of being restored. He's just been restored and given his marching orders. Just concentrate on you, Peter. Stop worrying about everybody else. What are you doing? Make sure you follow the Messiah. Because everybody's got to give an account. You've got to sit down with Yeshua. Two chairs, I've told you before. There's only two chairs. There's no Pastor Dave there. There's no Granny there. There's no Mum and Dad. It's just you and him. Yes. What have you done? And you recompense thereof. He knows the genuine and he knows the insincere. So where do we get our sense of justice from? Who, who, who says who says murder or rape is wrong? Where, where does your moral compass come from? Because these Christians will go, well, no, no, we, we, we don't need the commandments now. How, how can you not? Where, who, who, put, who died and put you in charge? Where, where are you getting your moral compass? Everything's relative and, and, and you're godless. And you think it all came from a big bang. And natural selection is your thing. 
basically survival of the fittest. That's what that means. Where, where are you going to get your moral compass from? Where do you get your sense of justice from? Your conscience. Who, who says you'd have a conscience? That part of you would be seared, wouldn't it? Where does your conscience come from? It can only be by intelligent design. It's from your creator because he made you in his image, Zelem. We have his sense of justice. That's why. It's inbuilt. His justice becomes ours. But we have this sin nature, don't we? And the more unjust we behave, the more seared your conscience will become. Your heart will grow hard, won't it? Gets twisted and bent up in iniquity. All truth belongs to God. Every truth there is belongs to him. Our mission in life is to find those truths. If we've, if we've evolved from primarial ooze, like these so-called clever atheists will tell you, our desire for beautiful truths like justice wouldn't make any sense. Because we wouldn't have a moral compass, no eternal vision. But because we're made in his image, everything about it makes sense. He guides us. He guards us. Yeshua sent these 12 lads, ordinary lads, just normal Joes, Am Haaretz, ordinary folk. In Matthew 10, he told them, you're going to be brought before governors and kings. Even though they knew they were. And they'd have been incredibly disturbed with that. Going in front of all these dignitaries, ordinary folk. Fearful, like, wait, what? I, what how's that work? What? What? What are we going to say? And he said to him, "Don't worry about what to say. I'll say it for you." Spirit's going to speak through you. You've got to let God speak through you. How many times have you shared with somebody, and you thought, "Wow, where did that come from?" And you know it's not you. It's, that, it's happened, hasn't it? You know it's not you. And, you only, and then you try and remember what you said. No. And you can't. Because the next time you try it, that's not for them. There's going to be something else for them. Just wait on the Lord. He's going to pick you up and blow you like a shofar. but you're not going to remember because it's not a fixed formula with him. It's not principles and pillars and, and set laws. Everybody's going to be affected different. You're going to push somebody's button different. So allow him to work. As seared as a conscience can be, as unremorseful as somebody can be, however bad the crime, they've always got a sense a sense of right and wrong. There's, probably, there's rebellion there, but it's there because it's God's put it in there and he wants none to be lost. It doesn't matter what the crime is, despicable, as filthy as a crime can be. If that person genuinely repents, they'll be in the kingdom too. That's a bit of a spin out, isn't it? But it's true. It's got to be genuine now. Everybody's redeemable. Adonai God, he made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Adam and Eve sin. The creator, the sustainer of the universe, defied by his creation. He said, don't touch. Man and woman says, no, we're going to do. At that point, Justice demands you do something. Our God is just. He's just and he's holy. 
He can make a law. He'll establish the penalty, but then if he doesn't follow through, that's going to render him unjust, isn't it? And if God's unjust, we're all done. But he is just, and he would do something. He could have destroyed us all, but he knows us. He knows that we're unjust. So he makes garments of skin for Adam and Eve, and he clothed them. Had to provide tunics of skin by means of the death of an animal. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There's no atonement. That's a law that still stands today. Leviticus 17.11 Life is in the blood. It would be thousands of years later, justice would be satisfied. But that was the plan. You've got churches these days. You've got great speakers, very effective communicators. Some of them don't have a Mancunian accent like me. <laughs> it's a good job we've got YouTube because it's got subtitles on it. You, you need it. Motivational, brilliant. We've got technology off the chain, bands that are brilliant, that can sing in keys so high only dogs can hear them. Brilliant, professional, no pub singers allowed. Fantastic facilities, programs up the wazoo. This is the church today, but it's dying. How come? losing its influence in the world isn't it being a Christian is becoming a very dirty word now Christian teacher in Ireland this very week was arrested because he wouldn't affirm um, a boy was a girl he arrested him the guy that came and arrested him we can see where it's going can't we Time to wake up and smell the coffee, maybe. There was another, I put a video on, on, on the Facebook. There's, there's, I think, I'm pretty sure it's England. Kid, he's got a chip in his hand. He walks into somewhere like Aldi or somewhere, buys a load of stuff, groceries. Zap, with his right hand, zap, paid. It's here. Does it ring any bells? Elon Musk putting chips in people's heads. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's good for disabled. And well, where's it going to go? How quick is how quick is it going to come? It's already here. It's already here. Wake up. Get right with God. Church is asleep. What's going wrong? I mean, we're we're not one of the cool kids. We're just not we're just not one of the cool kids. And he's never been one of the cool kids. In fact we're we're more akin to that ginger haired six told stepchild that nobody likes. That's that's messianic Judaism. Nobody likes us. But uh, whatever, you know. What we do is bring it back to the cross though. We bring it back to the cross. We're not popular. I don't want to be popular. What's right isn't always popular, and what's popular isn't always right, is it? All roads, Old and New Testament, lead me to the cross. You cannot go more than three feet from the cross. All the greats of old never moved away from the cross. But I'm thinking the church has thinking it has God made this sinless man be a sin offering on our behalf so that in union with him we might fully share in God's righteousness Paul's given us a doctrinal theological foundation for our justification and reconciliation for our faith across the board from Catholic to Charismania 
Yeshua's uh, sinless Passover lamb who knew no sin became sin so that we who knew no righteousness could fully share in God's. That's fair, right? It's incredible, isn't it? Off the chain, really. It's beautiful and it's incredibly hard to fathom that depth of love. But we cheapen the cross. You can't underestimate what he did. He came down from his place of glory, the king of all glory. It's not, he, he wasn't ordinary. He was never ordinary, was he? An, an ordinary Joel might put his life on the line for a friend. Like Paul said, you, you, you might consider dying for somebody righteous, but it's rare. But that wasn't this. That's not what he did. Even if you, you give your life pushing a child out of the way of a, an oncoming car and you get it, it's more than that. Yeshua, the king of the universe, he came down from glory, humbled himself into a baby. I mean, his nappy changed. The humility is just astronomical, isn't it? Human form into a slave to give his life, not for a friend, the worst of the worst. The worst of the worst. That's what he did. Those two criminals, they, that must have been serious, what they've done. You call them robbers, maybe they murdered. Who knows? Nobody knows. But it was serious enough to get crucified for. And he said, Yeshua, remember me when you come as king. Confessing to Yeshua as king in those last few dying moments of his life, repenting. And Yeshua said, I will. I promise you, I will. Beautiful. He's left it a bit late, maybe. But what a merciful God. Even as his lifeblood poured fast away, loving on his creation. Because he's just. He doesn't violate his own code of justice by pardoning those who have violated that very code and absolutely deserve its consequences. Our God is just. Justice is one of his essential characteristics but so are love and mercy. There has to be justice. Without it, we'd be lawless. Sin would be rampant. And evil would rule the day, wouldn't it? If we didn't have his love and mercy, we'd be very, very lost. If you, Adonai, kept a record of iniquities, Lord, who could stand? Don't move away from the cross because of this. Nobody could stand, not one. And can you imagine if he did keep a record of every iniquity, every thought, everything you've ever thought, said and done? Selfish, lustful, nasty, gossip-filled, backstabbing, It, the Lord hates that when you talk around behind somebody's back he hates that more than anything sowing dissension in the brethren hates it what if we had to pay it all back there's no way is there it's impossible it's hopeless he does keep a record everybody's got a book Revelation said Everybody's got a book. You don't want to open that book. You don't want to open that book. If you're not in the first resurrection, you're going to have to. Because if you're not in the first resurrection, you're not in his book. 
is your book of life. If you're not in it, you've got to open your own and stand on that and be judged. That's what it says. The second resurrection, the great white throne judgment. But then there's this next line, see? With you, Lord, this forgiveness. So that you will be feared. With God forgiveness. You can't get that from people. People don't. They won't they don't want to and they won't forgive. You hurt me. And I want to see you squirm. Forgetting what they've done to people. So they've hurt somebody. You have to forgive. And when you forgive, you have to forget. Because if you don't forget, you've not forgiven. You're still holding it, and it's going to eat you. It's going to eat you away like spiritual cancer. Unforgiveness. Let it go. You have to forgive to receive forgiveness. And we have to be eternally grateful God forgives and forgets, doesn't he? We go out and we seek and save the lost, the guilty sinner. What, a, what about the saint who's a sinner? Oh, what about them? The sinning saint. The guilty sinner's forgive, forgiveness, like I said last time, well, that, that comes through judicial forgiveness. One-time thing, right? It's judicial. The Father forgives us as a judge because of the bloody sacrificial sacrifice of his son, Yeshua the Messiah. The forgiveness for the saint, no. That's parental. And it's daily. Daily. One bath, many washings. I know I flogged that like a dead horse, but that's how we learn. You can be very saved, but not have a good relationship with your daddy, can't you? It's an easy fix, though. Easy fix. God's love provided what his justice demanded. I'm going to say that again. God's love provided what his justice demanded. The result being that the Lord would be feared. He has to be feared. That's not quaking in your boots. Fear. It's reverence and worship. His forgiveness has to cause us some reverence. We should rejoice with fear. Work out our salvation with fear and trembling, Philippians says. Thank him, love him, rejoice in him. Absolutely. But know whom before you stand. Show him the proper respect. The creator, the sustainer of the universe. He deserves all the reverence, all the respect, all the glory. He isn't as some churches push, like your homeboy. He's not your homie. He's not Pops. He's not the big man upstairs. Or anything else. He's almighty God, else you die. Show him some respect. Amen? Amen. I told you, old man, what is good? What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice. To love kindness and walk humbly with your God. Micah, this is Micah. Get this, he was living in a time of excessive and extensive greed. There was a rich and poor divide. Rich landowners pushing the poor out of the country, forcing them into cities where business owners were going to take advantage of them. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Not much has changed. This was 750 BC. 
I don't know. Demanding. He's not asking. He's not suggesting. He's demanding of you. No more than you act justly. Love grace and walk in purity with your God. So there's an outward part to that. An inward and an upward. Outward part, acting justly. Inwardly we love. And then we walk in purity, in humility, in subjection. Subjection, keeping yourself low, humble. Walking in God's will. And when you do, he pours out his love on you. Pours his power into you. And he helps you walk out purity. This is who we're supposed to be. We are supposed to do the right thing. Pursue and underwrite everything in love. That's what Beth Yeshua is all about. That's the foundation. He's the foundation. The love of the most will grow cold. Yeah, it, it already has. The world's very self-centered, very self-focused, and it's hostile to all things Christian. Just hostile full stop, though, isn't it? Always has been. It's frustrating. It can make you angry, but we're supposed to be the light in the dark. Can I, can I get the worship team up, please? Got a little surprise for you. We have to pursue love. We have to stay connected to Adonai. We have work to do. A lot of work to do. And it takes a lot of work. But, you know, we're supposed to work now. And rest then, what does he say? Well done, good and faithful. Come into your rest. It's easy to love those who love us. Not so much those who don't. But we pursue love in everything. Walk in humility. That's that's not humility is not thinking um less of yourself. It's thinking less about yourself. Open up your heart and look out and help others in need. That's the game. Moving when God prompts you. And not turning a blind eye to need. It's always better to give than to receive, he says. Right? So you're going to be blessed by being used by the Lord. Working for the kingdom's cause. That's what we've got to be about. Hands and feet of Yeshua. That's first century belief. That's what we're all about. Amen. We've